You're listening to The Back 40, the podcast for Ontario farmers, covering topics and issues that matter most to Ontario agriculture. Brought to you by Trillium Mutual Insurance, bringing the ag community together one podcast at a time. I'm the host of The Back 40, Mike Bryan, agribusiness specialist at Trillium Mutual Insurance. There's a lot of money involved in farming these days and a lot of assets. And as we go further along, oftentimes we want to see that those assets get transferred and our farm business gets transferred to the next generation. It's not an easy process. It never has been, especially when we're dealing with the number of dollars that we're dealing with in today's agriculture. But there's more than that. There's also those conversations that you need to have between generations in order to make it happen. Many times we don't have those conversations as we go along. Today we're speaking with Elaine Fraze. Elaine is a professional speaker. She is a family farm coach, and she's also a farmer. She's from southwestern Manitoba, and we're pleased to be joined to talk about some of these conversations that don't get started. Elaine, welcome to the Back 40. Great to be here, Mike. Thanks for having me. So for some of our listeners that may not be familiar with your work, could you give us a little bit of a background about yourself? So I'm a Manitoban and grew up on a farm right next to Winnipeg and moved to Boys Vane, which is 45 minutes south of Brandon, to work with Manitoba Agriculture 42 years ago. 40 years ago, I married a local seed farmer, so I'm on a certified seed farm with my husband, Wes, son, Ian, who's 32, his wife, Kendra, three grandchildren, and 5,000 acres of crop to put in. And over the last 30 plus years, I've been working with farm families to help them find harmony through understanding each other better. So these conversations that we all know need to take place, but we all avoid, why do people avoid talking about what needs to happen in order to have a successful passing of assets from one generation to the other? I think there's two big problems in agriculture, Mike, and quite succinctly, I call it conflict avoidance. People don't like to have conflict and tension in their life. And so the hard conversations, they just think that they can push them aside and avoid them and hope that they'll magically solve themselves somehow. And the other piece of that is procrastination. Let's do it after planting the soybeans and the corn. No, let's do it after spring. No, let's do it after the Ontario Farm Show. No, let's do it after harvest. No, let's do it after Christmas. No, let's wait till we get back from holidays, which of course aren't happening right now during this great pause. Uh, No, let's do it after seeding. And, And what I've just done to your audience is put them through a whole farming year and it's all gone by and they haven't done anything. And next year will be the same. And next year, it'll be the same. And then all of a sudden, you wake up and how did I get 10 years older? And and young farmers are the ones who come to me and say, Elaine, I've been trying to get my parents to the table to talk for the last 10 years. I'm still stuck. Help. That's a difficult problem. And I think it happens more often than not that that younger generation is ready to see a plan and, and the older generation isn't ready to let go. Is that really what it is that the older generation isn't ready to let go yet? That can be part of it, but you know, life is complicated, Mike, and I can remember speaking to the University of Guelph. It was January, a rainy night in January in 2019, and I asked them um, to go home that night and text their parents and ask them if they have a will. Well, the next morning, I was in a workshop in Woodstock, and a father came up to me and said, Elaine, you met my daughter last night. I said, yes, maybe I did at Guelph. And I didn't like the question you asked her. And I said, and what was that? And she said, well, I don't have a will. I said, precisely. And that's a conversation we need to start having, isn't it? Because here he is a multi-million dollar farmer, Mike, with a daughter in university who wants to take over this dairy farm. And he doesn't even have his own affairs in order. So the fear of the conversation is actually also about embarrassment, The parents know that they need to get more stuff in order and they've procrastinated and not done that. It could also be a sadness or a loss around what I call or what Merle Good in in Alberta calls your personal wealth bubble is that all of the assets are tied up on the farm side of the balance sheet and there's very little on the parent's personal side. And they wake up at age 66 and they go, oh my goodness, we don't have enough to live on if we stop farming and we don't have any money at all to shift around and allocate to our non-business air. So there's the whole fairness issue. And so they just kind of go, well, what are we going to do? How do we move things around 
to help everybody in this family be successful. And it's, it's a layered journey. And so there's lots of reasons, fear of, of not having enough money for their own retirement or their own change in life. Cause I don't think a lot of farmers on this call that are listening to this podcast are ever going to retire, but they are going to have to change their roles as they become 62, 72, 82, and 92. My oldest client was 96 he was transferring land to his 75-year-old son. That was an interesting meeting. There's all kinds of procrastination. And then the conflict avoidance is that people don't like tension. But as you know, there's a lot of emotion around who gets to live on the main yard, who gets the lion's share of farm assets to navigate to the next generation of farming. And then what about promises that were made 10, 15 years ago that can no longer be workable? You know, Renee Brown, who I follow on a podcast called Unlocking Us, is very interesting. She has a saying, being clear is kind. So my job as a farm family coach is to help everybody get clear about expectations, get clear about timelines and certainty of agreements, and then be committed to actually getting it done. Because it's a journey. It's it's more like an unfolding. It's not a sprint. It's a journey that's going to take everyone's desire to get good outcomes. Yes. And when you talk about you know, the farm family that wakes up at 66 and says, hey, I, I don't have enough for, to live on, much less to hand this over to the next generation. That's a conversation that maybe should have been started 20, 25 years earlier. Well, and again, in our case, my, my in-laws are Mennonite newcomers from Russia. And they came to Canada in 1926 with a suitcase, but they were wise in the fact that they built out a personal wealth portfolio beyond the, the certified seed farm and beyond my father-in-law's uh, preaching. And so in 1992, when Wes and I were ready to buy the farm and get equity in our own name, they were able to gift land to each of the non-farm daughters while they were still living and while these daughters were in their mid-30s. And do you think they were happy in 1992 to get a gift of $67,000? Absolutely. And then they were more than happy to transfer their gift of land into our ownership so they could cash out at that time for what they needed. Another saying I have is gifts with a warm hand, not a cold one, because that helps families share their intentions around why they're moving the wealth around. And nobody can fight that because they can hear dad and mom say, I'm transferring this asset to you now because of this. Blessings on your journey. I wish you all the best success. And people say, wow, that's amazing. I go, yeah, but that requires planning and, and not putting things off. And the sooner you can do that, you have that opportunity to see that farm prosper as well. It's really important that you see as giving that gift that someone else can be successful there. And if we transfer that through our wills, we never get that opportunity. Right. And, and again, when you look at where things go sideways, my lack of appreciation, pride and stubbornness and lack of forgiveness are some of the big three emotional factors affecting planning that were uh, researched by Tom Hubler from Minneapolis, who was my student coach when, in 2003 when I became a certified Hudson Institute coach. And, you know, I just got off the phone this morning with a farm family that's going through a divorce. And that's the conclusion they've come to. And I was fortunate to find a financial planner in Kitchener, who I referred them to, who's a certified divorce person as well. And she's a fee for service financial planner, because the first thing they have to establish in the divorce or in a succession plan is what do you need to live? What's your income stream going to be going forward? And I've used financial planners for years. And I know I'm good till I'm 102. And people say, well, how do you know that, Elaine? I said, because I've used an advisor and done the work and they've run the numbers. And that gives you huge freedom to know what your financial transparency is, Mike. And I have an acronym for, for fairness called F-A-I-R. F is for financial transparency. So when we talk about discussing the undiscussable or the bull in the middle of the room, which is my branding around, you know, how to get families to grab the bull by the horns, and talk about tough issues, the first place to start is with the data. Can this farm actually support two entire families? Or does one have to scale back? Can this farm afford, you know, the kind of housing that you're dreaming of? Because that's my second big question is, where are you going to live? 
And we all know that land where you live and, and housing is a very significant investment. And for a lot of people, uh, as they age, they don't want to move. But somebody who's managing that operation needs to be closer to the cows or closer to the bins or closer to the fields. And they need to be on the main yard. So that's where that gets creative. And then, of course, my third big question is the fairness issue is what have you promised or what expectations have you set up for the family siblings who are not farming? And that, again, is a conflict avoidance fear, because it's hard for you to say to your kids, I wish I could do these things for you. But you're a little bit entitled here because this farm is not being cut up like a piece of pie. So we'll have to find another way to help you be successful. And then I have other farm kids who say, Elaine, I don't expect anything from my parents because they've worked their butt off for so long. I just want them to enjoy their life. And if I get anything as an inheritance or anything from the farm after they transfer it to my farming sister or brother, bonus. And those are the kids that everybody wants to adopt. <laughs> oh, absolutely. They don't have outlandish expectations that a fourth of the farm is theirs just because they grew up on this concession road number three. It's splitting the assets equitably, not splitting the assets equally. And then you, you talked about that, make everybody successful. And that that's hard for some people to see and hard for some people to accept that maybe getting a quarter of that farm is not going to be equitable. And it's certainly not going to be fair to someone who's got a lot of sweat equity in that operation. Well, and the other thing I want listeners to think about is, do you have any idea how your mother was treated as a young girl? That's called the backstory. Or what is the story your mother is telling herself? Or what is the story your father is telling himself? Because if the father has been treated poorly by his father, and he had to wait till he was 66 to own anything, he hasn't been enjoying ownership for that long, right? Or if the mother was in a scenario where it was very patriarchal, and the girls were expected to marry well, and she actually wanted to have a, a kick at running the farm... All of those backstories impact how people make decisions. So one of the good questions I would ask the farm family is, tell me how you got the farm from your parents, or tell me how you were treated when you were first married, because that will give you good intelligence and good understanding as what they're trying to prevent or not repeat. And sometimes people make irrational decisions. You go, why is this so important to you? And then when they tell you why, then it helps you understand the other person's perspective. So in conflict resolution, you want to dig deep to put yourself in the other person's perspective. What does it feel like to be your mom? What does it feel like to be your dad? And get some empathy and understanding there. Another thing you want to do is you want to be able to create solutions. So you want good advisors who this is not their first rodeo in Southern Ontario. They have seen many farms do this successfully. And these were the key pieces that had to be put in place, right? And the other thing you have to do is you have to tell people when you're mad or angry or disappointed or upset or confused. And that's called sharing emotion because we all make decisions based on emotion first and then logic. But accountants and lawyers, and I, I work with tons of them, they're very logical and technical, right? But they go, Elaine, I have an interesting family I want you to work with. <laughs> and interesting, Mike, is code for highly conflicted or stuck, really, really stuck, because maybe even mom and dad are not aligned. And that's another reason why this doesn't happen at the table. You can't get grandma and grandpa to the table because grandma and grandpa are not seeing eye to eye on how they want things to unfold and then bring it down a generation. You're not getting mom and dad to the table because they're still waiting for grandma and grandpa. It can just trickle down through the generations. The stuckness just keeps getting more complicated because people are not aligned on how they want to create those solutions. It's very difficult to solve today's problems when grandma or grandpa maybe still owns and still controls that operation. And now you're saying, I want to get involved. And, and mom and dad are saying, hey, don't look at me. We don't have any equity either. It becomes even more complicated, Mike, when grandpa doesn't die, but dad dies, the middle generation. And I, I know of a case in Ontario where that just threw everything apart. And, you know, I've been in this business long enough that people do die on me. 
as I'm working with them. Not that I'm speaking that into people's lives, but I just got a note today from a young man I've been coaching and being a sounding board for him. And I was checking and he said, dad died May 10th, the lane. And now we're the executors. And now we're going to keep running the farm. And the conversation with uncles and grandma will have to wait. And so he already foretold or could foresee that complication, but there was nothing that he could do about his father passing with cancer. But fortunately, there was a will intact and that he can execute. So, you know, how do we get people to stop procrastinating is think about how good it's going to feel to not worry about stuff and have your affairs in order. The research on strong families is that strong families celebrate the good. And I just had someone text me today and say, what's your succession plan? Well, I have one succession plan in progress for our farm. Our son, who's 32, already owns part of the seed business, and he already has equity. We gave him equity in the form of a gift of a quarter section of land when he was 21, when his landlord broke the lease, and he had to come up with $220,000 by Friday. I mean, how do you do that when you're 21? You have to have the ability, Mike, to move quickly or to move assets around. And you can't do that unless you know what your opportunities are. So why don't you frame it as, I'm on this discovery to find out what my personal financial status is. I'm going to go talk to a lender and see how much I'm good for to service debt. These are all young farmer things that they can do. Another thing a young farmer can do is write a letter to his parents, how impassioned he is about wanting to be the next generation and why he needs timelines in place now to create a sense of urgency. There's lots that people can do when they're having people kind of push back from coming to the table. Now you talked about those uncomfortable conversations and your experience there with not having a will set up, which is the most basic of how you get assets transferred from one generation. But there's many farms out there that they've got their wills in place, they've got their succession plans in place, they've got contingency plans in place. And those farms tend to be the successful farms as we go forward. Those are the ones that you look at and say, there's a lot of point in making investments here because we know we're going to be able to get that to the next generation. And what's the common denominator of those successful farms? Both generations talking. And that it's an ongoing conversation. I had this one young farmer, Mike, he said, Elaine, being on this farm is like being in a conversation that never ends. And I go, oh, and the part about never end is that they never came to resolution, Mike. So conversations are helpful if they help you to focus and then actually execute. And on our farm, it, it's morphed itself into a joint venture. So my, my son's corporation is in a joint venture partnership with my husband and my corporation in a JV relationship, which is best for accounting and all kinds of other things that we like to do, because we have a very highly related relationship. Those other successful farmers deal with conflict in the bud too. They nip conflict in the bud. So they don't let drama or conflict or tension drive their decision-making. They go, oh, I see we have a disagreement here or we have a problem or there's some tension. What's the issue? And so they attack the issue, not the person, and then they create solutions for that problem and then they keep moving on. And I think in your mind's eye, you can see those successful farms that you drive by and you've interviewed some of them as well on your other podcasts, that it's that ability to communicate, focus on the issue, create solutions, pick the best solution, execute, and then evaluate whether or not that was a good decision. Do you like what you're hearing from the back 40? We'd like to hear from you. Send us an email with your comments and thoughts to theback40 at trillionmutual.com or follow us on social media at Trillium Mutual. Had an opportunity to meet with a pair of brothers that were talking about that never ending conversation, only in their case, it's what is going to happen, what can happen, and making those plans and then making contingency plans for whatever might happen down the road. And, and that's really important if you're going to be successful at getting this into the next generation. And another thing, I remember speaking in Stratford a couple of years ago for Women in Support of Agriculture. I think there was 180 women in the room and two men. One of the guys was part of my fan club that I didn't know I had. So he, he came anyway. These women, I challenged them to go home and get a talking stick, some kind of stuffy toy and a flip chart and to call a family meeting. And three or four of them emailed me back to tell me in trepidation that they had done this thing, but they had such an amazing experience, Mike, because at first they said, 
you know, the adult children were rolling their eyes, but when they realized that this was an opportunity to put everything on the table in a safe and a respectful manner without interruption, which is what the talking stick is for, they had very powerful meetings and the women were just elated that they were finally getting to the bottom of what people really truly wanted and being able to do that in a safe, respectful place, which is the family business meeting. Sometimes when we're afraid to start that conversation, yeah, sometimes it can go badly, but a lot of times it's just someone else is waiting to be approached by that and they want to know that you're interested and they have ideas and they're very open to how we're going to move these assets from one generation to the next, aren't they? Right, and then choose your language carefully too. I'm just curious, Dad. What does a good day look on the farm as you get older? And dad needs to realize that he's not being pushed and shoved off the farm. And then with mom, you know, mom, I'm just curious, where would you really like to live and why? And then she can explain what a good day on the farm looks like to her. And then for the daughter-in-law too, is it, I'm just curious, daughter-in-law, what is it that you need that you don't have right now? And she said, well, actually, the biggest thing I need to know is, am I taken care of if something happens to my dear and loving husband, your son? First of all, if he's disabled, what happens? And if he's dead, what happens to me? And so there's all of these questions percolating in people's brains that they just need to get out on the table so that you can start unpacking what the solution would be. And that question is is very pertinent because I can think of two examples in my area where the husband was killed in an accident on a dairy farm. And in one situation, the the cattle were sold within a month. And on the other in the other situation, that farm is still operating today and it's very successful. But that attitude of what did the wife want to do in that situation there, with, there was a very different answer to that when it came time for the question to be asked. And again, we can plan and plan and plan, Mike. But, you know, we have to be also willing to be adaptable to what the current reality is. Seems to be a lot of divorce in my radar right now, just because of the pandemic and the great pause. What I think the great pause has done for families is it's amplified pre-existing dynamics or conditions. And for some people, they've just decided it's a tipping point. They can't live this way anymore. And so they want to make some very clear changes and directions and how they're part of a farm business. And so I I just really want to urge people who are listening to just take some time to reflect. A really good question is, what do you truly want? What do you want for yourself? What do you want for your marriage? What do you want for your family? What do you want for your farm? What do you want for your relationships and friendships? And how do you want to show up in community? And what I've just outlined from a coaching perspective are your six key roles. And, and all of those roles need to be satisfied and to be in some kind of harmony for you to be content and happy with your life. Another reason people don't come to the table is because they don't know what they want. And so I know young farmers will ask their dad, what do you want? He says, well, let's just keep working. He's not willing to sit down and say, you know, I need to take better care of my back. I should probably get my hip replaced. I don't want to get my knees replaced. You know, there's all kinds of health issues that maybe they're pushing back and not paying attention to. I'm thinking of another dairy farm that I'm working with in Ontario that has a pretty high debt load with FCC for the next nine years, which they agreed to and making a a new barn structure. But it's that underlying driver that they really want to get the debt paid off and paid off well. And they don't really seem to have the energy to consider any other succession planning right now because they're so focused on paying down the debt. You have to dig a little deeper to find out why people are not paying attention to the cries for being listened to from the next generation. Yeah. And if the current generation can't answer the question, what does retirement look like for you? And the answer is just, well, I'm, I'm just going to keep working. It doesn't speak well for how the succession planning is going to go, because it sounds like they, in their minds, they're going to be there forever. And they could be. I, you know, I, there's an 83 year old that was on Twitter putting in his 60th crop or something in Saskatchewan. Well, good on him if he can do it safely. And he, his role has definitely changed from not being on the planter anymore, but to being the gopher guy picking up the seed bags and being an emotional support to the rest of the group. And that's great. But people have to recognize, Mike, they're not 21 anymore. 
in your 20s, it's about independence and everybody needs to launch, go to the University of Guelph or Richtown or wherever and get good egg training. And then they come back with all these ideas and they kind of get pushed aside because in your 30s, as you're having families, getting married, having mortgages, changing diapers, there's a lot of pressure there to balance work and family. But there's also that desire for ownership and ownership doesn't have to happen when people die. I'm a big proponent of looking at pieces of ownership over a long range of time where you can keep increasing the degree of ownership to the next generation and phase it in over time. So it doesn't have to be done in one large swoop. And then in your 40s, if you're 40 and you don't have power and control, that's an issue. And I just talked to a 35-year-old farmer today who has a parents who want him to be the main manager, but they have a hard time letting go of control. Oh, I've heard that before. I've seen that before. Yeah. So at the end of our call, I said, what's your line going to be? So here's the line we decided on. Mom, I'm going to be the main manager of this farm. You need to let go of control. And so whenever this becomes a control issue, he's just going to say, mom, I'm working towards being the main manager of this farm. You need to let go of control. And rather than getting discussed, because his line used to be, okay, I guess my day's done. I'll just leave now. That doesn't help anything. And what I'm trying to coach him to do is to have a voice to ask for what he needs. Mom, if I'm going to keep working towards being the main manager, which is what he needs, then you need to let go. And so both of them get more clear, Mike, on asking for what they need. And that's my role as a coach, I think, is to give people better language about asking for what they need and being clear about what they want. Another helpful phrase would be, I think it's time that you and dad went to a financial planner. I need you two to figure out what you're going to live on when you're no longer farming full time. How much money do you expect as a draw from this farm? Is it 40K a year? Where's the other 40 or 50K going to come from? Do you see what I'm doing here? So I think, I feel, I need, I want. I think it's time you booked a fee-for-service financial planner. I need you to figure out what your income streams are going to be because we're going to work on a succession plan where the farm pays you out X amount of dollars over so many years. And once you get that, then you'll be able to have the life you've always wanted and do the other things you may have wanted to do. But until we get some clarity around what you need, want, feel, and think, then we're hooped. So I think I feel I need, I want is a great sentence to fill in all of those blanks for asking more clearly. I look back at my own situation and my, and my own parents. My father was always really clear. I was actually quite fortunate that way that at a certain point he wanted to travel and he wanted to step back. And uh, I remember when we transferred control, he still had a lot of investment in the operation, but we transferred control over that. And I asked him what his thoughts were. He says, well, I'm happy to come and help out. But if I decide I'm going someplace in the morning, don't expect me to be there in the afternoon. And that was the first time that really it struck me about what that transfer of control actually meant. And I actually never ran into that. He never failed to show up to do something that I kind of hoped that he would. But we both knew it was always the option that he could do that. But on many farms, you don't see that kind of opportunity for the next generation. There's never been that clarity. Why is it, do you think, that especially men have a difficulty stepping back from that role as being the decision maker on the farm? In the work I've done, Mike, a lot of it is around what I do is who I am. It's an identity issue. If I can't put purple diesel in my truck anymore, am I a farmer? If I don't have the wheat board permit book, which of course they don't have anymore, you know, like who am I if I can't call myself a farmer? And so there's a lot of identity issues in terms of whose name is on the sign at the end of the lane. I'm always curious when I drive in Ontario to what, to read the, how the silo messages are, you know, my, my dad silo used to say Norman B. Edie and Sons. And that really bothered me because my mom was a very active partner in the farm, but her name was nowhere to be found up on top of that blue harvester silo. So really, a lot of it, I think, is around identity and, and where people get their self-esteem and sense of well-being. So if you are no longer the main manager of this farm, how do you feel good about yourself? You know, where does that affirmation come from? And that's why we do a lot of writing in June about appreciation of farm fathers. And the one I'm coming out next week on my blog was called The Good, Good Father. Because a lot of young farmers will say, Elaine, my dad and I have worked together side by side for like over 20 years, but I, I want my dad to be a dad. 
And so there's that dynamic, Mike, between the family system and the business system. And sometimes in farms, men tend to really get wrapped up in the business system, but they don't pay attention to their other roles, like i.e. being a good husband, staying well married, or how they show up as a father or how they show up as a grandfather. And my husband's greatest delight now on our farm is being a grandfather, and the delight he can take in his relationship with his grandchildren. And it gives him great pleasure to work collaboratively with his son. But on Father's Day, the best gift that he can be given from our farming son is a card with a note of appreciation that all of this opportunity is not being taken for granted. And my husband was almost killed in an accident three years ago while he was checking the soybeans and he collided with an industrial trailer at a a grid road where he had the right of way, but obviously neither of them saw each other. And when you have those trauma events in your family, they really crystallize to the couple what's truly important. And you don't wish that on anyone. You don't want stroke, heart attack, cancer, farm accidents, which we just had here in our community a couple of weeks ago, you don't want that to be the crystallizing factor for people to take action. You want it to be a conscious, well thought out choice and journey. Just keep taking the next step. I asked farmers, I said, why, why aren't you doing the, what you know you need to do? And they say, Elaine, we're just too busy. We're too anxious. We're too overwhelmed. And I say, well, you know, when someone dies, you go to their funeral, or we used to go to their funeral. Now we watch it live stream and during the great pause. But it was the example that I use, you know, if something is truly important to you, you will set aside time to do it. Yes. And don't let the fear of what you might find out in that conversation stop you from even starting it, because oftentimes it's not nearly as bad as what you might think it is going to be. We've spoken a lot about trying to move the farm from one generation to the other and getting that conversation going. There's another kind of topic that I'd really like to approach here, and that's a situation where you have everybody committed and everybody has said, you know, we're committed to seeing this go to the next generation. Here's the plan. And the child gets to the mid thirties and they're like, everything's going really well, except that I'm not really sure I want to farm anymore. How do you have that conversation? Because that's a real change in direction. Right. There's a word for that, Mike. It's called the successor effect. So when a founding couple knows that they have a successor who is committed, the successor effect causes them to go out and look for more growth opportunities, buy land, buy equipment, increase the size of the barn, whatever, and to deem it more viable and and more cash flow to support that second family, right? So here's the word that I will use. That was then, and this is now. And I've had a ranch family where this was truly the case. After we got working, it became very clear that one of the brothers was no longer willing to deal with what he would call a toxic or difficult relationship with another ranching brother. And there's a book by Dr. Henry Cloud called Necessary Endings, What to Do When Things Don't Work Out. So what you're talking about is a necessary ending. Plans were based in all sort of hurrah around this one thing happening. And now a 35-year-old comes to the table and after reflecting on the amount of stress, time, labor, and debt that was going to be required for him to fulfill his obligations, he's decided to get a pickup truck, a laptop, and a cell phone with the seed company down the road and be home by five o'clock. So he's made a decision to live a different kind of life, to parent his children and to stay married that's more congruent with the lifestyle or the life he's always wanted and that doesn't match the expectations of his parents anymore. And so to declare that difference or to declare that insight is very difficult, but it's way better to declare it now and say, you know what, I can't sign up for this. And yes, there's going to be disappointment and there's going to be grief and there's going to be loss, but ultimately you still want to have richness and relationship in that farm family. And you, the farming kid could say, you know, mom and dad, I know you've worked a lot of hours and time and advisors and investment to make it come to this place. But now that we've actually been in this place for a while, it's not what I expected. And I really need to make a course correction for, for, the, for my mental well-being and my emotional health. And this just isn't going to work. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but this isn't what I want anymore. And the parents, they have two choices. 
They can beat the kid up for changing the plan, or they can say, wow, our relationship to you is way more important than these cows or this barn or this tractor. And so tell me more, what is it that you need? And then the parents can either pick a different successor who might be not a family member, Mike. Mm -hmm. Farmer B down the road may not have had a chance to have his parents or her parents farm. And so maybe she comes into the operation now. And I have this case just north of me here where my friend is all Kelly Dobson. He's the coach with leadership. He is a young woman from Suris managing his farm. His son is not the manager and his son does other stuff in his other coaching business. So again, there's two sayings here. That was then, and this is now. Different is not wrong. It's just different. So now we're in a different lane of planning than we thought we were going to be in. But it's okay because now we know this is where we're at. So now that we have this current reality, how can we make things happen in the future? His father was able to give him a million dollars to help him restart a different kind of entrepreneur kind of thing that was separate from the ranch. And it was very fair for helping him be successful because the rest of the equity would still be going towards the other brothers in the ranch family. It's all around the concept of what do you do, Mike, when things don't work out or when the vision is not what you thought it was going to be. And you have to be willing to say, well, that was then, this is now, I guess we'll have to find a different way to make this work. And the parents might sell or they might decide to rent out land and check with their accountant about their tax situation and divest of all the equipment that they don't no longer need. Or maybe the son wants to have a custom operation and buy out the equipment, but not have the responsibility of the livestock and have a separate enterprise separate from the farm family. There's no one right solution. And, and when we talk about tough issues, another slide that I always put up is don't prejudge the outcome because you don't know how things might have to be adapted for down the road. Lots of different options there, and you just have to have the courage to explore what they are and find a solution for that. Elaine, you've done a lot of coaching over the years. You've helped a lot of different farm families. If someone's interested in finding more about the services that you offer, how do they go about doing that? Uh, best thing is just to jump on the computer and hit farmfamilycoach.com. And that will direct you to my site, which is elainephrase.com. I love it when people fill in a contact sheet and tell me what they're looking for, what they need. I'm happy to send them links to some of my most recent videos. The one I would love all of your listeners to watch on YouTube, which is called Finding Fairness in Farm Transition. Love it if I get more subscribers. I'm going to pay more attention to building up my YouTube channel. I'm also working on my own succession plan as a coach over the next few years, training other people to do the work that I do. I have five books now, Mike, and also links to podcasts and videos that just help get people prepared with the language. I have not yet made the t-shirt, but I have a family in Manitoba that said, Elaine, we, your name comes up a lot in conversation. I said, well, what's that about? And they said, well, do you have a t-shirt that says, what would Elaine say? And uh, I don't have that made yet, Mike, but maybe, maybe I will. But, you know, listeners need to know I am on this journey just like they, like they are. I'm from a farm family. My brother farms right next door to Winnipeg, 5,000 acres. He's also got a trucking business. My other brother's into property management. And he's back in Manitoba. I have a single sister in Victoria. But I lost a sister at age 23 to a drunk driver. And, and I lost my mom at age 65. So... I was in palliative care with all of my in-laws and my parents four times. So I'm not a stranger to loss and grief. I am really intent on helping families understand that conflict is not a bad thing. It just needs to be managed and resolved. And if you get really good at creating solutions, those things we talked about earlier, that's what I want to do. I want to help farm families find harmony through understanding. So just hit farmfamilycoach.com or go on YouTube and type in finding fairness and farm transition. And I'm here to encourage you. We have only just begun to scratch the surface of this topic. There are many, many layers to this. And I do hope that you will come back and uh, we can discuss some of those on a future podcast. Just encourage all of you during this time of the great pause, before you put your head on the pillow at night, just count your blessings and think about what you're so thankful for that in agriculture, we are deeply blessed to enjoy, even though we have a little bit different ways of navigating what's going on. Thank you for your invitation and I look forward to uh, where the conversation continues. 
Thank you so much. You've been listening to The Back 40, and we've been speaking with Elaine Fraze about farm succession and those difficult conversations that sometimes are hard to get started. Join us next time when our guest will be Jerry Boss from the Canadian Agricultural Youth Council. You've been listening to The Back 40, brought to you by Trillium Mutual Insurance. Be sure to subscribe to The Back 40 wherever you find your favorite podcasts so that you don't miss an episode. The Back 40, bringing the ag community together one podcast at a time. I'm Mike Brine. Until next time, take care and stay safe.